warning, if you don't want profanity in your podcast, it's already too late to fuck off. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by ZipRecruiter, Gabby, IP Vanish, and by Zip Unrecruiter, the service that finds a new job for that shitty coworker you want rid of. Preferably one that seems good until they actually get there, and then it sucks. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Revan. It's not Reven. It's not Raven. It is Revan. And despite what I learned growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men and women. It's August 26th. And it's National Web Mistress Day. So whether you're mastering CFNM or CSS, we salute you. Damn right. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. And for Shaquille O'Neal's New Jersey, Vacation Station Birthdayland, and Red Zone Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, people will die of COVID unnecessarily because of religion. Keith takes the week off to turn 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually finish this time. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. A lot of trailing music. At the Wait, intro. the intro it's goes me. quicker with just two people. Sure. Yeah, got it. Christian apologetics is the three-card Monty of argument. They're constantly loading a word up with very specific meaning, then flipping it over, shuffling it around with a bunch of synonyms or, you know, even just similar concepts, and then asking you to keep track of where the original definition wound up. Like, they'll start the sentence talking about faith, noun, one, complete trust or confidence in someone or something, and they'll end it talking about faith, noun, two, strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on a spiritual apprehension rather than proof. They'd be like me trying to disprove their holy book by pointing out that it didn't have any fucking holes in it, but if you're not careful, they're bait and switch you like that in a second. Hell, even the word religion itself gets silly puttified by religious apologists such that arguments against their side suddenly become arguments for their side. They'll argue in favor of religion as a concept as though a justification for the general idea of religion somehow necessarily transfers to their religion. I was left pondering this by a bitchy email I got a couple of weeks ago that excoriated me for not giving people a chance to explore the possibilities. It was from some spiritual but not religious unholier-than-thou hippie whose mind is open enough for moths to get in, and he was giving me the sort of standard quest-for-the-truth argument. You know, if you don't start with the assumption that I'm right, which is your first mistake right there, then religions have value simply for helping people explore all the possibilities. Except that's not what religions do. Religions sell one possibility and it's either going to be demonstrably false or so esoteric it's meaningless religions don't encourage exploration they forbid it they outlaw it they kill over it but even when they don't do that their goal is to crush the very exploration that this fucking dingling was extolling the virtues of i mean even the bullshit coexist sticker hippie shit this guy believes this you know everybody's right and all roads lead to the same god shit still promotes nay demands adherence to that one singular worldview Sure, it allows an individual the ability to wander, but it doesn't allow them the ability to get any fucking where. Of course, one can certainly study religion in their quest for truth. I don't think they're going to find much of use there, but it's worth looking into. But the existence of active religion makes that very inquiry all the harder. I mean, it's pretty easy to study ancient religions with no modern day adherence because we are all allowed to talk about Zeus with the understanding that he's a mythological being. If we had to hold out the possibility that he might still be king of the gods, it certainly wouldn't make our conversations more productive. I mean, I, I imagine any other academic subject being tackled this way, right? Like imagine if competing scientific theories work themselves out via schism. 
And every time there was a new theory, colleges would have to pick a side or split off into two different colleges, each one dedicated to a different side of that argument. And no matter which side ended up being true, both sides had to stick around as long as they could convince anybody to believe their theory. Does anybody really think that would make it easier to reach the truth? And if it wouldn't work for any other academic subject, why the fuck would it work better for religion? In fact, by promoting any single religion or even any single view on religion, you're doing more to shut down spiritual curiosity than the skeptic or even the cynic does. How thoroughly can you possibly explore a theory if nobody you're talking to disagrees with it after all? But most of all, none of that fucking matters. Because the other word this dude was playing three-card money with was the word truth. There's already a word for the quest for truth. That word is science. If your thing falls out of that, it's at best neutral in terms of finding truth. Most often, it's worse than that. By and large, religion is an attempt to avoid a truth. So far from denying people the ability to explore the possibilities, I'm saving them the trouble of wandering down dead ends. And I, I'm not and I'm not even blocking the fucking path. I'm just putting up a sign that says, hey, it turns out there's no truth down this path either. And if that thwarts your goals, your goals never had anything to do with the truth. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the block to my tackle, Eli Bosnick. Eli, are you ready for a little polyamory? Wow, you save punters like that for a week. Heath is away. You are cruel, sir. You well, are cruel. As, you know, as weird as it is to say, that joke only works when there's just two of us. And as you chew on that <laughs> conundrum, we're going to pause for a quick word from this week's first sponsor, ZipRecruiter. All right, Noah, you ready to do the ads? Uh, yeah, yeah. Give me one second. Let me grab Heath. <laughs> what? Heath's on vacation for his 40th birthday. Right, but he actually, he left this tape behind for us. Hey guys, didn't want to miss out on the points for the ads this week, so I left you this tape. I think we've done enough ads now that I can pre-record my bits, so just go ahead and start now. I mean, there's no way that we can actually do so the- Eli's probably back-chatting me right now about being able to pre-record my part of the ads, because his writing's you know, pretty formulaic, so yeah, whenever he's done with that, go ahead and start. Fine, fine. I've, uh, up! Come on, boy! Up! Hey, Eli, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to teach this walrus to climb a building dressed as Spider-Man. <laughs> That's right. I am also part of the wacky shenanigans Eli and I are involved in. Me Damn. too. Got you there, dude. It's not always wacky shenanigans. Sometimes it's, it's kind based of on the Very product. much is, yes. That's what's happening. But, okay. Uh, try, the walrus thing. I'm doing the walrus thing, apparently, well, with Heath. Why don't you hire a professional walrus trainer? In this economy, trying to hire the right person is like trying to find the needle in a haystack. Well, why don't you just try ZipRecruiter? Oh, what's ZipRecruiter? Damn it, he even got the timing down. Nice. So, no, you can stop the recorder now. Oh, you know what? Note to self. See if milk comes in container larger than a gallon. So when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, they send your job to over 100 of the top job sites, giving you access to their network of millions of job seekers. Then ZipRecruiter's imaging technology scans resumes to find qualified candidates for your open roles and proactively presents them to you. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. Wow, that does sound easy. Novel idea in the future. Everyone is bald, so the people who went bald first are the most handsome. Uh, no, I think Keith wanted you to turn. No, the I, tape I'm, I'm going to let it go though. Okay, okay. So that ZipRecruiter thing sounds great. Where do I try it? Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address: ZipRecruiter.com/scathing. That's ZipRecruiter.com/scathing. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com/scathing. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Note to self: Return Merkin. Did not convince Coffee Shop Girl. Also, note to self, find new coffee shop. Oh, buddy. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, professor of sociology and secular studies at Pitzer College, Phil Zuckerman, would like to remind you that atheists are better at all the important parts of existing in society than our religious counterparts. Yep. Apparently, Salon took a break from atheist bashing long enough to publish his article reminding everyone that on pretty much every meaningful measure of a person's morality, vocal atheists utterly trounce the piously religious. 
The article focuses on how much more ethical we are in terms of environmentalism and pandemic mitigation, but he also cites studies that show us coming out ahead in terms of supporting refugees, affordable health care, death with dignity, gun control, LGBTQ rights and animal rights, as well as in opposition to militarism, the death penalty and government sanctioned torture. Huh. That's weird because I'm pretty sure religious people have assured me that we don't appreciate the beauty of a sunset. It probably even yeah, out. no, it's probably, probably even right ends after that. Yeah. So to be clear, <laughs> he's talking about atheists in this article, right? He's not lumping Ooh. us together with the nuns and the spiritual, but not religious dingbats like so often happens. We're talking about in the author's words, quote, atheists, agnostics, people who never attend religious services don't think the Bible is the word of God and don't pray, end quote. And he's comparing us not just to like religious people in general, but regular church attendees, people who pray frequently, people who profess to be absolute in their conviction that God exists. And when we run the numbers on any meaningful measure of morality, it looks almost unfair to pit those two groups against each other. Right. Which is even weirder when you consider that what those people claim to be doing is reinforcing their morality yeah, once a week. Exactly. Right? That would be like publishing a study that finds that gym members are in worse shape than people who never go to the gym and don't believe gyms help you get in right. shape. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> They've the mass deniers. Yeah. And look, I get that we talk about this subject a lot. In fact, Damn near every study that Zuckerman references in this article had a dedicated headline in this show when it first came out. But given how frequently we have to answer the morality question, I think it's justified. And since you probably can't get your religious cousin all the way through a diatribe, I like highlighting the articles you can actually share with them when I find them. You'll find it on the show notes. But the key takeaway is the same as always. The numbers suggest, but don't quite prove that atheism makes you a more moral person or being a more moral person makes you an atheist. But they do prove religion does not help. Yep. Yes, indeed. And in Farrington 451 News, nice. as a skeptic, it's important to admit when you don't know something. And truth be told, I really don't understand the idea of religious exemptions as a concept. I mean, it seems like if there's a universal and equally applied law about common good and your pretend thing goes against that law, the answer should be no. But lots of smart people assure me that it is, in fact, a good thing to have accommodations to religion. So, you know, whatever the subtle truth of religious exemption is, that's certainly not going to stop assholes from abusing it. And that's exactly what happened this week as Christian pastor and man who can only be described as COVID superfan, <laughs> Greg Farrington of Destiny Church in Rockland, California, gave out hundreds of letters of religious exemption for COVID vaccines to literally anybody who showed up and asked for one. OK, so here's the thing about religious exemptions. Either you have them and shitty people use them to abuse the system and secure extra privileges for themselves, or you don't have them and shitty people use their absence to abuse people of minority religions and secure extra privileges for themselves. Mm, so you're saying it's a tie. I'm not quite saying that. <laughs> So for those unfamiliar, Farrington has been doing his best to, I'm going to go ahead and say wingman for COVID <laughs> since the very start of the pandemic. So last year, he blamed church closers on, quote, liberal crazies and Satan. And when several members of his church caught COVID, he celebrated by saying on stage, quote, the favor of God is on this house. So, yeah, that guy handed out literally hundreds of religious exemption letters last Sunday to anybody, member of his church or not, who wanted to not get vaccinated, saying, quote, you have the freedom to choose, and nobody should be able to mandate that you have to take a vaccine or lose your job. That's just not right here in America, end quote. Okay, so uh, uh, on the one hand, a letter from Farrington exempting you from COVID precautions is as binding as a letter from Eli exempting you from Lyme disease. On the other hand, wish the Walmart greeter good luck explaining that shit to typhoid Karen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So there you have it. As from the very beginning, whether society, law, science, or just good conscience has attempted to slow the spread of this deadly disease, religion has always been first in line to stop it. Eh, amen. And in Darwin, some lose some news. Fantastic. Americans, thank you. Americans are profoundly <laughs> stupid when it comes to subjects. In fact, 
I'd wager that if you measure our intelligence against the per capita dollars we spend as a nation on education, we may be the stupidest people that have ever existed in all of human history. And nowhere, you USA. You USA. <laughs> Thank you. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and nowhere does our stupidity shine brighter than in the topics of science, because it, we're dumb when you ask us shit like. Who did we fight in the War of 1812 and 1811? And what's an adjective? Someone who tries to get you to buy adjectives. Uh, but but so that's just regular don't know stuff levels <laughs> of stupidity. But when you ask a shit like, how old is the earth and did humans develop from an earlier species of animal? You get motivated stupidity. And that's why <laughs> lying stupidity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why even basic shit like the majority of Americans believe in evolution is worthy of celebration. Now, according to Gallup, we actually crossed that threshold for the first time way back in the story days of 2016. But <laughs> we, we got both confirmation and a bit more detail from a new paper in the journal Public Understanding of Science that breaks down three and a half decades of data on the subject and shows a precipitous rise in American acceptance of evolution over the past decade. Okay, two things. First of all, for the less literate listeners, precipitous means rainy. Second of all, <laughs> the public understanding of science journal has got to be the biggest fucking bummer to read. <laughs> <laughs> Every cover's black like the Time magazine from 9-11. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's still bad, guys. It's still fucking bad. <laughs> so so this paper comes out of the University of Michigan. It looks at a number of different surveys over the past 35 years that include the question, do you believe human beings as we know them today developed from an earlier species? And it charted the response over time. And what they found was that for like a quarter of a century, we pretty much had stagnancy on the issue. Pretty much the whole time, acceptance and rejection of this easily provable scientific principle was tied between 40 and 45 percent. But right around 2007, the numbers started to diverge. And then at Pretty much the exact same time as this show debuted, the chart turns 45 degrees upward and starts its climb towards the meteoric heights of ever so slightly above half. Go! Hey, I'll take that credit. The scathing atheist convincing people to believe in filthy monkey men one at a time. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, of course, the survey isn't all good news. Uh, I, I mean... The fact that it only shows 54 percent national acceptance of the central theory undergirding all of modern biology isn't good news to begin with. So there's that. The researchers also emphasize that the movement seems to be in the younger generation's rate of acceptance. So it's like it's not like we're changing the minds of evolution deniers. We're just making it harder for them to recruit. But worst of all, the chart seems to have peaked in 2017 and acceptance of evolution, though still a majority, has been on the decline since Trump was sworn in. So. Always plenty more work to do. I mean, I get it. 2016 onwards has also shaken my faith in slow change that increases survival. It's not a great excuse, but I get it. I'm saying no, yeah. I get it. <laughs> right. And in now, that's what I call an upright position news tonight. We've all had a bad flight or two in our day. Turbulence, a long wait to take off or land. But I'll wager each and every one of us are all in second place to June 15th's American Airlines flight from Washington to Chicago, whose disboarding was ground to a perfect halt so an off-duty pilot could grab the PA and explain to everyone how Jesus <laughs> saved him from being gay. Oh, my fucking... I So, okay, so I would have shoved that hand set up his ass in a completely heterosexual way then. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus. you'd have you listen to have to do it. So, yeah, the unnamed pilot, apparently apropos of nothing, thought to himself as people were getting ready to get off the plane. Oh, that reminds me of how gay I used to be. <laughs> Grabbed the PA, blocked the exit and began to monologue to everyone in the plane over the speaker system about his child molestation, about marrying a woman, even though he was gay and being gay behind her back, saying things like, quote, even though I was in love with her, just over one year into the marriage, I began to give into the pressure of being gay. I asked other gay crew members questions about their lifestyle and what led them to becoming gay. Pretty soon, I was taking part in that lifestyle. I had sex with men and would come home from work trips and pretend nothing had happened. End okay. Quote. 
All right, so you already spoiled the ending. I know this is going to end in Jesus, but I feel like I would have forgiven him if he'd gotten graphic enough with this part, right? Like, there's a level of graphic he could have gotten, like, where it would have looped back around and he'd have had. Someone on the YouTube video is just like, let's hear him out. Let's hear him out, (laughs) guys. Now, as I mentioned, he concludes by talking about how Jesus ungayed him and finishes by saying, quote, ultimately, I want to share the love of Christ with you. If you feel uncomfortable, that's fine. But I will talk to you in the gate area. Thank you so much. Oh, End you quote. bet your ass you to talk to me in the gate area. <laughs> Dude, it would have been worth you doing it just so that you would have had to talk to me in the gate area. <laughs> but my friends, all is not lost. For though this is a story of airline assholery and it has a villain, it also has a hero. And that hero is the gentleman in the YouTube video, link in the show notes, who quite literally, right after the guy finishes talking, yells at the top of his lungs, if I miss my next flight, I'm suing your ass off. Fuck you and your story. (laughs) (laughs) And in fine by me news. Australia is mostly kicking ass at this whole pandemic thing. While there have been a few missteps along the way, including possibly kicking off the whole toilet paper hoarding phenomenon, uh, they've done a pretty remarkable job in the most important statistic, deaths. As of the time of this recording, the total number of COVID deaths in Australia has yet to reach the four-digit range. Jesus. Yeah, 984. Compared with America's 647,680. Well, shit. Hell, compare it with the thousand plus Americas that died of COVID the day of this record. Yeah, we're beating you daily. Beating you every day. Yeah. And and look, yes, Australia has a much smaller population, but it's not that much smaller. Mm -mm. If you look at it per capita, that's one in 25,772 Australians compared to one in 506 Americans. Boom. Americans are 51 times more likely to die of COVID. And part of the reason is that Australia is willing to enforce laws even when you crime religiously. To wit, the $1,000 fines police were handing out to churchgoers on Sunday night when the Christ Assembly Sydney Church elected to defy lockdown orders. Huh. I wonder if a legal system that doesn't have magic loopholes for death cults has anything to do with the four figure death figure yeah you know it's probably the surfing the they surfing do a lot of surfing probably, yeah they surf a lot yeah so police in new south wales were tipped off to the gathering on sunday night according to reports they arrived around 7 30 p.m and found about 60 adults and children gathered masklessly and with no thoughts to social distancing ultimately 30 adults were fined a thousand dollars each and the church itself was fined five thousand dollars now those are australian dollars so you know multiply by 0.725 or whatever, but still (laughs) kind of hard to imagine any jurisdiction in America finding people for going to church just because it's illegal and dangerous. Yeah. And, and that's keeping in mind that as police minister, David Elliott pointed out, they can still worship. They just have to stream their services like every other fucking church in a COVID hotspot in the goddamn country does. Yeah. And it's weird, but something tells me now that it costs them a thousand dollars not to do that. Everyone at that church is going to get real conversant in that part of Mark about praying at home in your closet yeah. or whatever. And it's crazy. So weird when there's a disincentive, you know. <laughs> now, it's, it's worth adding, by the way, that the offending church is part of an international religious group headquartered in Nigeria called Christ Embassy, which has a well-documented history of spreading conspiracy theories about COVID. In a since-deleted sermon from another Australian chapter of the same church, a church leader apparently told his congregation, quote, In the name of Jesus, we refuse every lockdown in our cities. We declare the lockdowns are over in the name of Jesus, end quote. Yeah, you better hope Jesus is also willing to co-sign a $30,000 loan to you yeah. guys in his name <laughs> as well. And look, it's pretty easy to make a country's COVID response look good when you compare it to the United States, but... Like right now, they're actually facing a very serious outbreak in the Sydney area that last I read was topping 800 new cases a day. Right now in America, where evangelical Republicans are going to gather together for freedom parties to cough on each other like God intended, no matter what the churches do. It's easy to overlook the very real damage that shit like this is doing in a place that actually could otherwise contain the damn thing. Yeah. Even when governments are doing it right. Religion will do it wrong, is what yep. we're learning. <laughs> God, and on that echoing reminder of the show's central theme, we're going to pause for a word from our second sponsor this week, Gabby. There we go. 
all the Donkey Kongs in a row from the very first one. Hey, Noah, what you doing? Uh, me, I'm just organizing my retro video game collection. Just arranging all the early Donkey Kong cartridges, which I have in order. All the Gen 2s. Noah, did you write this banter into the ad just so you could tell people you own a bunch of old versions of Donkey Kong? Okay, you know, a small but dedicated section of our listenership greatly enjoys my early video game references, Eli. You should do a podcast about it. What Don't if you did a podcast? Even start. What, what do you want, dude? Oh, I just finally figured out what to get Heath for his birthday. Auto insurance. Auto insurance? Yeah, but not just auto insurance. I went through all the hassle of comparing prices, entering in all the info, getting actual quotes instead of just the, you know, the fake ones you get at most comparison sites. He is going to be so pumped. But Eli, if he wanted to do that, he could have just gone to Gabby. What's Gabby? Gabby uses your current policy to compare your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide, and Travelers. They're the one true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes, not ballpark guesses. And because Gabby uses your current coverage, they only show you policies that are the same or better than your current coverage, many of them at a lower price. And Gabby is free to use, and they never sell your info, so no annoying spam or robocalls. Wow, and it really works? It sure does. I tried Gabby out before they were a sponsor, and they found me three cheaper quotes than what I was already paying. People who switch with Gabby save, on average, $80 a month versus their current policy. $80. Wow. For that kind of money, I could have gotten Heath like a nice shirt or something instead. Sure. Yeah. And it's not just me who loves Gabby. Gabby has been featured in TechCrunch, Forbes, and USA Today. Start saving on your auto insurance today. Go to Gabby.com slash scathing to start saving right now. It's totally free. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash scathing. Gabby.com slash scathing. All right, Noah. Sounds good. Uh, speaking of comparisons, did you know that the Intellivision and the Intellivision 2 are actually the same system? Just an aesthetic reboot. Just do the video game podcast, man. Just maybe do a, do maybe a I podcast. will. Do you do another podcast. He's, he's gone. And we're back. Next up in headlines, Christian pastor, bigot, and the Christmas spectacular host you never knew you needed, Eric <laughs> Metaxas, was asked to put on a mask this weekend while he was on a skiing vacation. And he's pretty sure it went getting asked to put on a mask, something, something, Hitler's Germany. So we're going to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So at this point, the scariest aspect of this shit is is what these people's complaints about Nazi Germany actually have been this whole time. Like, turns out the <laughs> genocide wasn't as much the issue. It's like, well, I mean, whatever he thinks the parallel to masks is, but that's not genocide, I don't think. Hitler and his anti-smoking laws. <laughs> right. Yeah, so Eric's on stage talking to some other fucking Christian chode about how terrible it is that everyone's being asked with sugar on top not to give the planet COVID. And he tells the following story, quote, a young guy is like, sir, you're going to put on your mask. I'm getting on the lift by myself, right? And I looked at him and I said, you've got to be kidding. I didn't say punk, but it was implied. And here's where it gets serious. He stopped the lift. End quote. Yeah. Wow, man. If they stop the lift because you're unwilling to follow a rule that can't possibly harm you, it sure is a sign that someone other than you was being an asshole. Wasn't it? <laughs> Better repeat this story in as public a forum as yeah. possible. Jesus and Christ. I know what you're thinking, podcast listener. Hey, that sounds a lot like the rise of the foremost fascist government in world history. <laughs> well, Eric is right there with you saying, quote, how did it happen in Germany with these young brown shirts would behave like that? And I was astonished because I thought this is how it happened. And yeah. quote. <laughs> first, they came for the contagious diseases and I did not speak out. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> yeah. So as many of you may have noticed, there's a lot of Hitler comparisons flying around in the media right now, which is why we're pleased to present the brand new segment on the scathing atheist. Is that like Nazi Germany? Hit it, Morgan. Hi, I'm Chet Chetley. Welcome to the very first episode of Is That Like Nazi Germany? Our contestant today is Eric from Texas. He enjoys sucker punching reporters and trying to get laid by women who think he's Geraldo Rivera. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me, Chet. I think it's a damn shame they turned you down for Jeopardy. Yeah, rank the races in one mass email. I know. I know it. 
Anyway, let's get to the game. You know the rules. I tell you the situation in modern history, and you tell me if it's like Nazi Germany. Are you ready? Nazi Germany, We Chet. haven't started yet. We haven't started, Eric. Sorry, I got excited. First up, wearing a mask. Nazi Germany. Oh, I'm sorry. How about get a free vaccine so you don't kill the people around you? Nazi Germany. Oh, another wrong one. Okay, last one here. The recently discovered genocide of indigenous children at so-called residential schools all over the continent. Well, the context there is so important, Chet. You really can't just... Oh, I'm sorry. That's O for 3, and you are out of the game. Mm, people hate Christians. They sure do. And that's why we'll see you next time on... Is That Like Nazi Germany? in lgb2 quo quay news tonight well done christians fucking hate gay people i feel like we don't say that enough right between them allowing gayness in a subsect of a subsect of a subsect of christendom and you know culture dragging mainstream thought up to barely equal values in you know just some of the world and where religion has the least power that thread has been lost and the cultural zeitgeist instead is that you know most Christians are just plain groovy with gay people, and there's a few cranks in Noah's neighborhood that are not. That's not the case. No. It has never been the case, and as long as we keep ignoring it, it never will be. And that point was proven once again this week when a new paper published in the Journal for Personality and Social Psychology examined just how often LGBTQ progress is seen as an attack on Christianity by Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so the best you could say for Christianity, given the numbers, is that it might not be the chief source of bigotry in the entire country. And for that, they get tax exemptions. Yep. That is, that's what they got. It's good. So you're probably wondering, how did they reach this conclusion? Well, they asked Christians and Christians couldn't fucking help but tell them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For instance, they asked straight cisgender Christians how much Christians and LGBTQ groups were discriminated against in each decade. And whenever things got better as a group for gay people, Christians said they got worse for Christians. Wow. <laughs> well, next time somebody wants to fault me for defining Christianity by their prejudices, I need to remind them that like they're only a cleverly worded question away from doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to list four things that are bigots. You tell me which <laughs> one is not you. And it actually gets worse. Quote, strikingly, Christians reported that bias against Christians is as severe as biased against LGBT people <sighs> in the current decade. What? Christians also endorsed explicit statements pitting the groups against each other. Example, as LGBT individuals face less discrimination, Christians end up facing more discrimination to a greater extent than other groups surveyed, i.e. heterosexual cisgender non-Christians and LGBT participants. Yeah, when you think you have the right to other people not having rights, this shit's going to happen. Exactly, exactly. I mean, look, in the Christians' defense that were surveyed here, at least a According to the way Christians define rights, they are correct, right? Yeah. If your definition of rights includes not selling someone a wedding cake or going to their preferred bathroom, then yeah, you're losing your right to not do the thing that you or you're losing do. your right for other people other to not do the thing, right? Right, and that that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I, just, I guess what I'm saying, if I could simplify all this down, is that they're wrong about rights, and even if they were right about rights, their rights are wrong. <laughs> well said. There we go. And finally tonight, in D. DeVossing news, Fantastic. the arduous task of dismantling Trump's legacy got a tiny bit closer to completion this week when the Department of Education announced their intent to rescind one of the stupid fucking pro-bigotry rules that he and DeVos enacted. In particular, the rule that exempted religious groups on college campuses from anti-discrimination policies. Speak of the devil. The rule stemmed from a 2019 executive order and threatened to withhold federal funds from schools that forced religious groups to play by the same anti-discrimination policies as all other on-campus groups, or when stripped of euphemism and plausible deniability, it allowed Christian groups to kick people out for being gay. Yeah, or unmarried. 
and having sex. Or, in the case of my alma mater and a certain Christian group there, rape victims. Wow. Real fun set of bylaws the Trump admin was paved in the way for there. It, really mm -hmm. having fun. So when this rule was first enacted, American atheists and Americans United for Separation of Church and State sued. Uh, they pointed out that A, that shit's illegal. And sure B, is. <laughs> well, yeah, but even if it was legal, it wouldn't be a thing that the Department of fucking Education would have the power to do. <laughs> but last Thursday, the plaintiffs in the case asked for the courts to stay their lawsuit pending a rule change that should nullify the problem. Now, it's a Christian privilege, so the Biden administration is hesitant to just release a statement saying, no, this was always bullshit and we were never going to let it fly. But couched in a verbose promise to review the rules and submit them for public comment was a pretty solid indication that their intent is to do away with the problematic elements of the rule change. Yeah, we just want to remind everyone how seriously Joe takes religion. He loves checks notes, Jesus, and we <laughs> take his uh, fellow... Jesus fans very seriously here at the Biden administration. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and look, Trump and his cabinet broke a lot of toys on their way out the door. I, I mean, even when they weren't trying to, their incompetence led to the decay and corruption of most of the federal government. But once it was clear that they were on their way out, they set about systematically breaking as much shit as they could before they left. So as easy as it is to assume this rule was always going to get changed back and it was never going to be enforced, we need to thank the hardworking folks over at American Atheists and Americans United for making sure it stayed a priority amongst the millions. Mm -hmm. And with that token of gratitude, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Eli, thanks as always. God sucks off a turtle. And when we come back, Tom Cecil Heath and a few guests will be here to actually finally for realsies close this thing off. Oh. Si, si, grazie. A tutti di gelato, please. Mi scusi, tutti? Si, si. Hey, Heath! Damn it. Really? Eli, I'm, I'm on vacation. You know I'm on vacation. Yeah, How sorry. Are you even I, here? I had a question for you. <laughs> Hi, Bob! Heath hasn't introduced us. Oh, actually, you know what? Does this rash look like something I should be oh, worried about? That. Where are you going, bud? Bob? Bobby! Bobster. Okay, probably going to the bathroom. He seems nice. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's a nice person. So, what's up, man? You, you had a question or something? How did you even find me? Oh, you've been using free Wi-Fi all over Europe, and whenever you're using free Wi-Fi, you're super easy to track. What? Seriously? My Wi-Fi? Oh, yeah. You should use IP Vanish. Oh, what's IP Vanish? That's a fun little game we play on the shows, Bob. Probably wouldn't understand it. You, you and Heath play fun games? Probably not, right? Anyway, IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short. A VPN is an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. Okay, that sounds great, but I'm kind of on vacation. Don't have a ton of cash to throw around right now on tech. Uh, just to keep you from following me to Italy, I'd, I wish you would just not do that. Okay, well, for that. listeners of the show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off their annual plan, equal to six months free. Equal, you say, to six months. That's right, he 65%. Equal, yep, equal. So go to IPVanish.com slash scathing. Claim your 65% savings. Their annual plan is just $44.99 for the first year with our exclusive discount. This is the time to sign up with our discount and their current promotion. You can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot. And that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Remember, it's IPVanish.com slash scathing to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. Great. Fine. I'll sign up now. So what did you want to ask me? You came all this way. <sighs> you know what? It slipped my mind, but I will find you in France if I think of it. Please don't do that. All right, have a good trip, buddy. Happy birthday. Bob, Bob, it was nice to meet you. I'm going to send you a picture of that rash, bud. I want your eyes on it, okay? Okay. No, I got it out of Heath's Don't phone. Just, he's, he's pretending he doesn't hear me. He hears. You know, back when Heath was a wee young lad of 39, we offered to trade on the show insults for charitable donations, and we radically underestimated how fucking charitable you were, so... Here we are, exactly 637 days later, finally capping off the final segment of Vulgarity for Charity. And as a thank you for your patience while we work our way through them, it even includes an Anna song. So without further ado, we're going to join the final Vulgarity for Charity segment already in progress. 
For the next round, we have some brave and charitable donors who asked for themselves to be roasted. Heath, this one's for you. Matt wants a roast of Matt. Okay, so Matt sent us before and after pictures from when he cut off all his long hair as donation to Wigs for Kids. And yeah, Wigs for Kids, that's a great cause. But now... There's a kid with leukemia somewhere walking around looking like a fucking Muppet samurai and <laughs> wondering about a really awkward return policy at Wigs for Kids. <laughs> that sucks. I don't want to fuck a woman with fake breasts to music from the 80s and cocaine. Can I get a different one? No? Okay, just this one. <laughs> All right, Cecil, you're up next. Cliff's son asked for dad to request a self-roasting, so we need a roast of Cliff for Cliff and Cliff's son. Okay, so Cliff, you don't look like Patrick Stewart. I know you cosplay like Patrick Stewart, but you do not look no. like Patrick Stewart. You look no, like bald, bald, Walter man. Cronkite, man. <laughs> you, look like, you look like Walter White from Breaking Bad if he just settled for chemo and dying a chemistry teacher. <laughs> I mean, the only thing you have in common with him is you're bald. Yep. It's like me cosplaying Jason Momoa because I have a beard, man. Oh. <laughs> God damn. Oh, now I really want that. Right. I, I love that. Cecil's one-act play of Breaking Breaking yeah. bad now. It's just like, uh, yeah, I'd die now. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. I hate my health insurance company. Yeah. I'm going to donate to Vulgarity for Charity real quick. All right. There we go. I really wish we had a stronger union for those medical benefits as a teacher. Just, man. Oh, Should have gone on strike. <laughs> Noah, this one's for you. Macy wants a roast of himself. And, and who can blame him, right? Like, he looks like if <laughs> Chunk and Sloth and the Goonies had consummated that relationship. Oh, no. <laughs> kinda, he, he looks like he, it kind of looks like he ate the vanilla version of the blueberry gum from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Just a little. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. By the way, I should point out, he specifically <laughs> asked me so to go after his looks. Like, as though there was ever any question, Macy. Go, like, yeah. Come on, obviously. I'm gonna... <laughs> we we're going to hit up your Sudoku <laughs> skills, dude. <laughs> You look uh, like if a Stretch Armstrong could go bad, man. We got this one. We got it. We're good. And Tom, Philip wants a roast of Philip. A German guy who wants me to roast him. Oh, I'll me. do it. Yeah. <laughs> How fucking original. A German sadomasochist. Whoa. Hey there, standard fucking issue. Hope you didn't trip when you were shit out of the cookie cutter U factory. <laughs> You want me to roast you, specifically me. The guy whose shtick here is cruelty. That's what you're asking for. That's what you want, Philip. Is public humiliation the only thing that gets your fucking dick hard? If I'm going to play along in your little public self-flagellation roleplay kink, you better fucking tip me a little bitch because this dungeon is your fantasy, not mine. This is the best you could come up with, Philip. A world of assholery all around you to roast, but you need this. You need me to tell you on air that you're a bad boy so you can sit on the can and breathlessly wank one out. Well, here's my fucking roast, Philip. Next time you want someone to step on your balls in front of a room full of strangers, bring some cash. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And oh, Eli, God. you're going to close out this self roasting around here. <laughs> we need a roast of Jamie for Jamie. And also a roast of Eli by Eli. Yes. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Is that second part in the email from Jamie? It's irrelevant. It's two said votes. Now. Three <laughs> votes. Seven votes. It's official. Four <laughs> votes. I, I want that. Five. Okay. I, mean, I, get I just want to say vote. 11. <laughs> I'm getting all Fibonacci. the hard ones today. Okay. <laughs> Jamie is a gorgeous trans woman who met the love of her life when she sent this roast. And, you know, since that's a two year old lesbian relationship at this point, I'm guessing they're now married with two big dogs <laughs> that they <laughs> pretend are friendly, but they're not, Jamie. Okay. You got a poodle the fucking size of a car bus. It's not friendly, Jamie. It's a murderer. <laughs> all right? It's a murderer. And for the roast, I mean, come on, Jamie. I'm supposed to roast a tall, blonde tennis champion? I look like the new version of the feels bad meme. I look, <laughs> in the words of my own baby sister last month, like if minors could have a rabbi. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, that's my sister said. Sister's amazing. Yeah, I asked her why she included pictures of me on her Instagram, and she said, "Because you look like minors could have a rabbi." Great. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Oh, that's but amazing. that actually gives me an idea, Jamie. Jamie, you look like everyone who looks like me harasses on the internet. Two for one. I did. Yeah, I nailed it, everybody. I got it. Well done. 
We also had a couple more guest roast requests, including a few donors who wanted their targets roasted by opening arguments very own Andrew Torres. Andrew? Thanks, guys. It's a uh, pleasure to be back, or uh, that's at least what Eli has written for me to say in the show notes. So uh, let's see what we got here. First up, we have a request from Jeremy, who wants me to roast writer Ryan Johnson of Star Wars Episode Eight. Okay, Ryan Johnson looks like he was proud to get tattooed by the girl who kicked the hornet's nest, right? If Australia had a national pervert, it would be Ryan Johnson, and he's not even Australian. Um And then next, Melanie wants me to roast the cow named P. Andrew Torres, right? Yeah, the only thing on earth that is or ever will be named after me. Hey, thanks, Melanie. Um, But uh, all right, here goes. Um, Is there a D quality beef? Is there an anus rather than an Angus cut? Is there a grade F quality milk? You know, the kind only fit for McDonald's milkshakes. If so, all of these products would come from P. Andrew Taurus. And um, while I mourn the destruction of my cow namesake, thanks, guys. Let's toss things over to the one and only Lucinda Illusions. Thanks, Andrew. So I've just got two to knock out really quick. Gavin wanted a roast of atheist YouTuber Jacqueline Glenn, and I'd love to do something really biting here, but I'm not too familiar with her work. Well, I mean, I might be familiar with it before she plagiarized it, but I don't know it through her. So all I can say is that she looks like a Raggedy Ann fuck doll, and I'm pretty sure that's what she's going for. I also got a request from Michelle to roast her misogynistic dad, who has three daughters, each with multiple advanced degrees, but doesn't think any of them can truly be successful until they're married and have children, preferably male. And look, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with the guy. I mean, other than looking like a geriatric Popeye that let himself go in the 80s, but people who think they can define success for others are, in my experience, people who are trying to find it vicariously. So my guess is that he said he never got to fuck a dude and bear a child. But y'all have more advanced degrees than me, so I'll leave it to better minds. Now, we had one more special request here. Christy wanted Anna to roast Heath, but just add a little spice to it. She wanted Anna to do it in the voice of drunk Stephanie. Anna? Where are my shoes? Oh, there they are. So, like, I'm going to ask, like, Heath, because, like, it's his birthday or whatever, and he wouldn't even let me give him a lap dance at his dad's funeral. Heath looks like every guy that's ever dated me, and, like, we went to the same high school. Boom, roasted. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go throw up on the changing table in men's room. Thank you, Anna. And we're going to be hearing from you one last time before it's all over. But that's going to bring us to the final round. Heath, this one's for you. James has an excellent request. He wants you to roast the U.S. healthcare system. Oh, wow. OK, good pick. Um, all right. So uh, I feel like it's easy to understand maybe as an analogy. So the U.S. healthcare system, it's a lot like chess. Uh, most of us are pawns who get sacrificed. Um, <laughs> white goes first and has an advantage. Um, Norway is way ahead of us in the standings. Their guys at the top. And uh, our peak was in the 70s and involved a Holocaust denier. So that's fine. <laughs> there you go. That's upsetting. All right, Cecil, you're up next. Daniel wants you to roast Micah Bell from Red Dead Redemption 2. <laughs> what? Okay. Micah Bell looks like someone left Luke in the belly of a tauntaun to ferment. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just want to assure you too, Daniel, that I took time out of writing roast to fire up the PS4, capture Micah, and light him on fire with moonshine and dynamite. Consider him roasted. He's 100% roasted. <laughs> Okay, Noah, you get two options for this one. Janelle wants a roast of either Michael Ferris or David Barton. Okay, well, obviously I'm tempted to go with Barton because holy fucking shit, that guy. But I get plenty of chances to insult him. So instead, I'm going to go with Michael Ferris, the head of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and the founder of Patrick Henry University. This man may have done more to de-educate children over the last 20 years than any other Christian. That's really saying something. And in another hard one honor, he may have the world's bitterest Wikipedia page where he, I mean, I'm not he, I'm some anonymous Wikipedia editor. We have no idea. Sure. Uh, Explains. David Darton. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, Dykel Ferris. Yeah. Yeah. 
explains that he probably only lost his race for lieutenant governor of Virginia because he was such good friends with Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and Jesus. And people <laughs> hate it when you're friends with religious people. That's very bad in political office. Anyway, Eli, you're up next. <laughs> <laughs> Larry was a roast for a rideshare passengers who say they'll tip and never do. Ooh. Oh, Jesus. Ooh. Yeah. As Larry puts it, if they'd been a pizza, he'd probably have gotten a couple bucks. Hey, hey, <laughs> rideshare people who don't fucking tip. I am the snobbiest person I know, and I literally know an Italian duke, and I fucking tip. Okay, rideshare is the craziest, worst part of our technological post-humanity hellscape. <laughs> oh, did you need to survive the crushing economy? Well, why not let some strangers into your car whose qualifications include downloading an app to a phone? It's like <laughs> driving a taxi without all that cushy regulation in the way. These are the fucking ice road truckers of our great nation. <laughs> and the least you can do is throw them a tip and a good one. 20% or you fuck yourself. There you go. <laughs> All right. And last but certainly not least, we have a request from our biggest donor of the entire charity drive, Lori and Brad, ooh, ooh. who raised six thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars. Wow. wow. More. Jesus. Ooh, right? Again, just Lori and Brad. Unbelievable. And also a guy named Dave who made the same request. He also helped. Fuck you, Dave. Get off Lori <laughs> and Brad. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Also some money. So the target Looking out for the little guy. is anti-tax activist Tim Amon. And of course, we're all going to pile on this motherfucker. Okay. <laughs> we got a picture of him here. And he looks exactly like the soul of Elon Musk. <laughs> like if Elon Musk got soul, the king of life. That's him. He looks like a Tesla henchman from the future who like Came back in time, Terminator style, to stop Eli from murdering Elon Musk with one of his flamethrowers. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Skeletor shoved his head in a Mr. Potato so he could take his senior photo. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a salesman for the Ed Gein Furniture Company. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucked up. He looks indicted. Right, like I just—he just looks like does. just every yeah. indicted white guy, or he looks like that one guy you know who's doing well, but in your head it's uh, just like you know, well, yeah, until he gets indicted, he looks like that guy. <laughs> pending, yeah. Tim Iman only wants two things: he wants money and attention. And I mean, I get that. Like, I like both of those things. But the thing is that the money and attention—that's all he wants. That's it. He doesn't want money so he can pursue a dream and be a better, more interesting man, or to travel the world and broaden his horizons. He doesn't want the money to use it. He wants money to have it. He wants money for money's sake because he doesn't know the difference between having values and financial value. And the need for attention is even worse because he doesn't care who it's from or what it's for. He doesn't want attention the same way you or I do. He doesn't want the world to see him and to appreciate him for his talents or skills or thoughts or dreams. He has nothing to show the world. All Tim wants is more eyes, more attention. He wants to make up for his lack of depth with a breadth of audience. And he'll shit on everything and everyone to get them both until there's nobody left looking. He looks like he wasted a totally good use of a flamethrower. You know? <laughs> looks like he cheats at golf, by which I mean, after he and his buddies play golf, they cheat on their wives together with each other. He looks, he looks like the inappropriate picture mainstream media insists on using of every white guy who just killed his family dog using the family cat. Yeah. <laughs> but he does though. But he does. All right, well, do it. he looks indicted. Yeah. I mean, no, you nailed yeah. it. That's perfect. All right, well, I'll tell you what. We've gotten through a ton of it here, but there are a couple of roasts still to go. A lot of people want us to make fun of their dogs, so we're going to close it out in style. Hit it, Anna. Special mutts. I bet the other dogs avoid their stinky butts. Cause one's a dingo berry in the shape of a dog. And the other looks like a blanket hog. Ugh, that's the worst. Artemis ruins the envy for no reason. And six turn over in every crotch like a horn. Eat your loaf of bread and your pumice stone Then look at 
Did you like alternate universe Raven Simone? That's so funny. You were a bad dog, a bad dog. You put your poor human through the ringer today. You were a bad dog, but don't be a sad dog. 'Cause everybody loves you anyway. Oliver is a tripod dog who made Kendra cash in. Looks like an old rusty tricycle, but then make it fashion. And chances got it made, but he doesn't seem to care. 'Cause that seal pup sleeper eats your diapers and your food and poops everywhere. Every found you might. With her literal shit-eating grin, you were a bad dog, a bad dog. You put your poor human through the ringer today. You were a bad dog, don't be a sad dog. 'Cause everybody loves you anyway. Penelope was living outside in the cold. Puppies in Houston and barely a hold on things. Then Ari came along and everything went wrong. Now they're paying for Penelope's weight and go for that thick ass little piggy who deserves a heckin' score. Bad dog, a bad dog. You bet your. Tim and Dina found he's like a fluffy feral hamster with no social boundaries. And Briar the Beagle has a heart of gold, but he's literally chewing on his foot in the photo. Yuck, that's so gross. Why would he do that? You were a bad dog, a bad dog. You put your foot. Thank you, Anna. Also, thank you, Tom, Cecil, Andrew, Lucinda, Bryce, Dan, Mark, Frank, Thomas, Seth, Don Ford, Voice of Fantasy and Adventure, and everybody else who helped us work our way through the more than 1,000 roasts we had for 2019's Vulgarity for Charity. And thanks to all the listeners and all the donors for bearing with us. We're going to be putting some guardrails in place to make sure the next one is just the three or four week thing we originally intended. But hey, to raise six figures for charity, we're, we're going to do what we have to fucking do. Oh, and before we blow out the candles tonight, we want to wish our very own Heath Enright a happy 40th birthday. It's Friday, not today, but hey. We joke around about his absence from social media quite a bit, but in truth, he's a lurker. He sees it all. He doesn't comment very often, but he sees it all. So if you have a chance to wish him a happy birthday via Facebook, Twitter, or I think he's even on Instagram now, it would brighten his day. And his day is already going to start on vacation in Italy. Just think about how fucking bright we could get it. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Rat, being at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Booze, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our Half Sister Show Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this episode would be too light to stay on your phone if I didn't weigh it down with some much deserved thanks to Heath Enright for letting me be a part of his fourth decade. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for focusing 
focusing the old jokes on somebody else for a few weeks. I want to thank the lovely and talented Lucid Illusions for making getting old so damn much fun. I also want to thank Revan for providing this week's Farnsworth quote and for not being a Jehovah's Witness anymore. Way too many of them as it is. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Xenia, Brett, Bad Credit, Good Credit, No Credit, come on down to Throckmorton, Fraud, Peter, John, Buckland, Misty, Stu, Jason, John, Park, and Taurus, and Jennifer. Xenia, Brett, Throckmorton, Fraud, and Peter, whose sexual magnetism is measured in Tesla, John, Buckland, Misty, Stu, and Jason, who are hot enough to make that fusion reaction in California jealous, and John, Park, and Taurus, and Jennifer, who could have smushed together a couple of hydrogen atoms with their sheer might if the scientists had just asked. Together, these 13 thoroughly thoughtful theist thwackers were lucky enough to join Earth's most storied fellowship, people who give us money. Not everybody has the legendary bravery and cunning it takes to give us money, but if you want in on the action, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Martin Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. It would be hilarious if Morgan just didn't put in any sound effects for that. At all. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2021, all rights reserved.